Hello, this is Mike Knudstrup for another segment on Principles of Management. This one will be about groups and group behavior. As always, I welcome your comments. Uh, YouTube doesn't always seem to forward them to me, but when I see them, I will respond. So we're talk talking about groups, groups and groups behavior. We'll get into roles and norms, the stages of group development, such as forming, storming, norming, and performing. Conformity in groups. Uh, a gentleman named Solomon Ash after World War II studied it. Also, uh, groupthink. Conflict in groups and the different methods of handling it, such as compromising, collaborating, forcing, avoiding, and accommodating. And then also briefly about social loafing, a uh, phenomenon you might have experienced in your own group project. All right. <clears throat> So to begin with, what's the difference between roles and norms? Roles are specific to a position, and they're a set of expected behavior patterns for a position. Role conflict is when people hold differing expectations of your role, and role ambiguity is when you don't really know what your role is. You know, we have our roles in many different areas of our lives. For example, in your home, someone could have the role of cutting the grass. Another person could have the role of doing the laundry, something like that. At work, someone might have the role of... Oh, gee, what could be a different role? Perhaps being the treasurer, uh, keeping track of the money or the accountant in other words. Another person might have the role of coming up with new ideas. Another person could be a peacemaker. So there, there are a lot of different roles uh, that, that people can have. When you have role conflict, that means different people expect different things from you. If your boss expects you to speak up in meetings and you don't believe that's your role, then you'd have role conflict. If you have role ambiguity, you don't know what your role is. When you're new to a job, you probably have a certain amount of role ambiguity. When you're new to a team or a group, you have role ambiguity. All right, norms are shared by everybody. You know, for example, I mentioned you know one person cuts the lawn, maybe at your house, as a, as a role, and uh, another person might do the dishes as his or her role. So those are roles specific to the individual. But what might be shared is everybody in our house does chores. So norms are uh, standards or expectations that are shared. You know, in a workplace, for example, my workplace, we're expected to show up on time and take care of our classes um, and hopefully handle student issues on our own. We're also expected to be collegial and friendly. All right. So as part of being, a, being successful in your job, if you know your role and you fulfill it and you also accept and perform according to the norms of your workplace, you will be successful. How do these roles and norms play out in a group process? All right, there, there are stages that groups develop in. And it's pretty uh, famous stage model, uh, the most famous model of group development. Forming oops, forming is the first stage in group development and that's what's the basic objective of the group and who is the membership. So this is the first stage of group development. Storming is okay we got our group, we got our objective. What are the role? Number two, what are the roles that people are going to fulfill? You remember what roles are specific to individuals. Someone might be the leader. Someone comes up with new ideas. Someone might be the planner. You know, someone might be the treasurer. Keep track. But when the storming stage is done, then we move to the third stage of group development. Based on the root word norm, I imagine you can guess what norms are. Norms, a norming stage is when they develop norms for the group. You know, are we going to show up on time? Are we going to do what we said we're going to do? Are we going to be polite to one another? Okay, so that's the third stage. And the idea is, you know, 
people work through these stages more or less in a sequential fashion, moving to the next stage when one is completed. <clears throat> so when forming, storming, and norming are completed, then we can start performing, doing the actual work itself. And then finally, you know, if it's been a short-term uh, uh, group, a temporary group, when it's all done, we adjourn. And groups often have some sort of event uh, that uh, gives them closure when the group is done. You know, if it hasn't been an enjoyable experience, obviously people most likely go their own way. But uh, if it has been a good experience, some kind of final event, a little party or something to give closure to the group. Uh, so how is this useful, this, these stages of group development? I know in my classes, for example, I try, you know, I take uh, group projects very seriously. I think they're great experiences for learning uh, about working together in groups. And from the day one, I am trying to work students into these stages so where they get to know what who know some people uh, to form a group and then they have time to determine who does what roles and what their norms are going to be so i take a good two or three weeks before i expect students to really start performing in their group you know when you when you try to jump right from forming to performing or doing the task that causes problems doesn't it think about it you try to go okay well, all of a sudden who's on the group and you try to start performing people are going to be stepping on each other's toes oh i thought i was going to do that oh you're going to okay so you're going to be the, the leader whatever and they won't have their norms established about how they're going to operate either so it's good to have patience and try to work through the stages as groups develop an issue that uh, became very <clears throat> much of interest after World War II was that of conformity in groups. In World War II, there was you know, a lot of well, a lot of deaths. Um, I've seen as many as 50 million deaths attributed to World War II, and there were researchers that just wondered how how could so much conformity occur? Obviously. There were people who were nonconformists who didn't go along with some of the leaders in World War II, and you know bad things happened to them. But there was a certain amount of conformity, and so researchers wanted to find out, you know, what role groups play in conformity. One man was Solomon Ash, and if you want to see some interesting video videos, look for the Ash experiments, and you'll see some interesting videos on conformity. But here was uh, here's most one of the most popular. Uh, studies by Ash. So we'd have a group of people around a table. Boom, let's see if I can do this. You know, a group of folks around a table like that, and everybody would be in, in on the experiment except for one person. All right, everybody else were Confederates. Okay, they, they knew about what they were trying to do. They'd hold up a line and they would say, All right, one, two, and three, A, B and C, which of these lines A, B, and C is most like this line? And they'd go around the table and they'd ask this person, this person, this person. Everybody would say A, for example. What do you think the likelihood is that this person, the experimental subject, also said A, that they gave in to conformity? And as you watch some of these videos, it's kind of humorous how the, the folks' faces are scrunched and like I can't believe people are saying this and yet at the same time they would go along with it so about one-third of the time or 33 percent of the time 30 percent of the time the people would go along with the group even though they knew it was was wrong uh, and this was a rather surprising aspect now, some people might think well gee 33 you know should have been even higher so that does show some individuality Anyway, uh, this demonstrated one of the experiments that demonstrated the the influence uh, of others and conformity. Another surprising incident is <clears throat> that um, if one person, one of these person breaks from the group uh, and, and says, you know, says B for example, pretty much the person that this other person uh, tends to go tends to go with their conscience and and go along as well. So when there's unanimity in conformity, it tends to be about 33%. But this dynamic 
breaks down if one person doesn't go along. So next time, you know, when you're in a conforming group situation, maybe even gently, you can break, go against the flow if you think it's the right thing and, and maybe see how, uh, what happens with the group dynamics. But conformity became a very pressing concern of interest after World War II. Another, uh, phenomenon, phenomena of groupthink uh, group uh, conformity is is groupthink, and that's where there's extensive pressures on others uh, to uh, to conform. And there might be you know a few people who are dissidents, but they're kind of quashed, they're pushed down to uh, conform with what the group wants. <clears throat> and as a result, that everybody seems to agree, the group seems to feel rather invulnerable. Well, everybody agrees, and so groups often do more crazy things than an individual would do just because they have that appearance of unanimity. All right, so they feel kind of invul invulnerable, and there's often a stereotyping of outsiders, all right, in this process that makes it easier to act against uh, them. There's not like a common enemy to unite, as the saying goes. You, uh, I know when I was a undergrad, certainly I was a part of, of uh, groupthink where, you know, I was part of a group of guys and we did things that uh, maybe weren't so appropriate, oftentimes on a Friday night, something like that. <clears throat> but a particular interest is, you know, how do we reduce groupthink, right? Because bad things happen oftentimes when groupthink occurs. People will do much worse things in a group if they all seem to agree um, than they would as an individual. So how do you reduce groupthink? Well this has been studied quite a bit. First maybe uh, you would reduce it. Let me get my pen over here. Just awareness. Like many management and psychological concepts, awareness is a, an important first step. <clears throat> Another might be to take a break. All right, you know, this seems interesting, you might say, but let's uh, wait till tomorrow before we make the final decision, okay, before we do that. All right, another <clears throat> might be for allow for anonymous voting. You know, let's, uh, let's vote anonymously, let's write on a piece of paper and we'll fold them up and let people know, um, you know, how people really feel. Another one is kind of a fancy word, they call it devil's advocate or you know, maybe appoint a contrarian. Someone to take a contrary view. And you know, if you point some groups have that person naturally and they feel like a stick in the mud and people get tired of it. But if you rotate that uh, group membership, then uh, that should not occur. But groupthink, you know, common thing that happens. There have been some famous examples of groupthink in the night, I believe it was night. 1986, maybe it was, in the American Space Shuttle Challenger. A space shuttle, uh, well, some of you probably, many of you probably weren't around, but there was a space shuttle and there were problems with the O rings. And there were a couple engineers that uh, said, hey, you know, those, it's a cold day, the O rings are going to freeze, the fuel's going to leak out, and this thing is going to be a problem. But they'd already delayed the flight for the Challenger several times so there was a lot of pressure on them to go ahead and then unfortunately if you want to see a, a very disastrous video look up space shuttle challenger on youtube and i hope i got the date and the exact terminal term right uh, but you'll see uh you know a very tragic explosion of an american uh, spacecraft <clears throat> there are other examples of group thinking you can find them if you you look them up on uh, on, on Google. Okay, <clears throat> another element of, of groups is how do we resolve conflict in groups? It depends on how assertive and how cooperative we want to be, you know, and, and what the issues might be. All right. For example, if we're very cooperative, we might just accommodate. And when the when would we do this? When would we just accommodate? Accommodate means you know, we, we, okay, I'm giving you it. You want it, you got it. Maybe when we're weak in power, weak in power, or it's not an important issue, or maybe, you know, someday you want to do a trade-off. 
That's when you might practice accommodating. When would you avoid? Well, similar to accommodating, maybe if you're you are weak or the other and the other person is strong, maybe when there's danger, you just get out of there. All right, and you avoid the conflict altogether. Now my diagram here has competing when you want to be high in assertiveness and low cooperativeness. I've also seen it called forcing. You might force your way. When would you force your way? Perhaps when you're convinced you're right. You know, this is a matter of principle or morals. We're going to do it this way. I don't care what everybody else does. You know, maybe if it's a time of crisis and you just got to move. Or there might be, um, all right, you might be the strong party. It's like, you know, I'm just getting my way this time. A particular interest to folks are these two right here, compromising and collaborating. A little difficult to differentiate, but in general, compromising was where you meet somebody somewhere along halfway. All right. Often, you know, compromising generally occurs when there's only one issue. Let's say you're selling something, and you, um, you know, the only issue is price. In America, that's dollars. Where you're at, probably could be something different. So you just find somewhere in the middle that you compromise. That's when there's only one issue. When you've got more than one issue, then you can collaborate. A lot of times you'll hear the phrase win, win in terms of a collaboration. All right. When there's more than one issue, how do we do this? More than one issue. You can collaborate. For example, I, I have rental properties if you've listened to my other videos. And sometimes tenants can't pay rent, <clears throat> but they'll have a special skill. <clears throat> so as opposed to evicting them or to go through all the hassles, if I believe it's going to be a short-term issue, I might have them do some work for me that I need done. Sometimes works better than others. And I get worked on, and then they get uh, credit for their rent. You know, what would be another example here? Um, let's say you got office space, one window, and a lot of space. For me, I would take a little bit of a space for my office. And then I would give a lot away, uh, a lot of uh, floor space away that didn't have the window. But collaborating is done when you have more than one issue and the parties value things differently. You know, somebody in an office might value a lot of square footage, and another person might value having a window. So the one person would take a little bit of space with a window, and the other would get a lot of square footage. You have one or more issues, and you can increase, you know, we call win-win, or not just dividing up the pie, which is what compromising is, but increasing the size of the pie. All right, <clears throat> last thing I want to speak about here, uh, just briefly, <clears throat> is social loafing, a very common aspect in groups. And if you've had group projects or um, at your workplace, you probably noticed this. The larger the group gets, the less each individual group member tends to do. So, um, <clears throat> uh, what do you do uh, about social loafing? I had I had a couple guys doing some work for me, and alone they were awesome. But once they once the two of them joined up, one would watch and the other would work. And then flip-flop, another one would watch and give directions while the other worked. All right, so basically two people doing the uh, the group of, the work of one. I have students complain in their groups. Generally, I've found that uh, group sizes in my classes of about three to four people are optimal. After that, five and six, someone gets left out. I don't know if it's the structure of the group. Uh, how they've structured it or whatever, but the larger the group gets, the more likely you're going to have social loafing. So what are some things you can do? Well, what I try to do is try to have people assigned to specific tasks with specific deadlines. You know, fairly straightforward, but when people are clear on their roles that they're going to be evaluated in that work, then they're more likely to do it. Also, of course, have contingent rewards and punishments 
if they they don't work, um, if they don't do their part. But surprising, you know, also known as the bystander effect. Oh, come here. There have been surprising car accidents where everybody just sat there and watched the car burn, for example. You know, but if there's only one person, well, gee, it's only me. I need to save this person. It's a pretty funny, uh, well, and that's more tragic in those instances. But as there are more people, then they tend to take less responsibility for what gets done. All right, so that wraps up groups and group behaviors. Again, I welcome your comments uh, when I receive them. I will be happy to respond. You can also send me emails. All right. Thank you for watching and listening.